We are continuing our study in eschatology. And so we, we have covered so far is what eschatology is uh, and that you need to use the principles of hermeneutics in your Bible study and that there's two principal bias that people have when they approach the scriptures, even with a hermeneutical procedure or process. And that is one is covenant theology. The other is dispensational theology. And we talked about the differences of both. We here at the chapel were dispensational in our position and our approach to the scriptures. We are preacher premillennial. And so we believe that the tribulation of the, uh, the tribulation that's coming, that the church will be raptured before that event and that the tribulation precedes the millennium of the reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Now, what I thought we would do for the next uh, few weeks is actually look at the end times events that are prophesied in the Bible, what we call it the latter days in the Old Testament or the end times or the end of the age, uh, however you may refer to it, but it speaks of the final hour of world history as we know it today. And so I thought we would look at how that would be meaningful to you and I, the church, the body of Christ. As you study through the book of the Revelation, you know that only the first four chapters apply to you and me. The rest of that book applies to the unbeliever until the very end when we return with Christ to reign with him for a thousand years. Hmm? And so I thought we would look at some of those events. And the first two events that we would be looking for as the church, most of Bible prophecy has been fulfilled, but there are two major events yet to be fulfilled that you and I as the body of Christ, and if you're a student of prophecy, are looking to see fulfilled. What might they be? The rapture, of course. And what? The Gog Magog, invasion of Israel. Now, both of those two prophetic events are the next things to occur on the prophetic calendar or the schedule of God. Now, we don't know which would be first, do we? We really don't have a way of determining that. So what I thought we would do is look at the first one, the Gog Magog invasion of Israel that's described for us in Ezekiel. And then over the next several weeks, we'll look at our position on the rapture, the rapture of the church. But let's go to Genesis for a minute, chapter 6. Didn't Pastor David do a wonderful job on Children's Day Sunday? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then the baptism, the waters of refreshing and new birth, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Chapter 6, I want to pick it up in verse 5. Now, you, you know what has taken place, that God had created the world. The world was in rebellion to God, unfortunately. And God is going to deal with the rebellion of the world. He had given him enough time. And it says in verse 5, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man, and it was great in the earth. And every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Even after God had cleansed the earth, the heart of man is still continually evil or wicked until he experiences that born-again or resurrection of the spirit experience, right? And it goes on to say in verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man upon the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air. I am sorry that I have made them. Oh, my. Yeah. Be a, a sobering thing if parents were sorry that they birthed their children. Hmm? And God is sorry that he birthed these people who have been in such rebellion to him. Evil, violence, wickedness throughout the entire earth. Any of that sound familiar to you today? Why don't you turn with me to Luke chapter 17? In Luke 17, and towards the end of the chapter, uh, Jesus is speaking on the second coming, the end of the age, the latter days, the end of time. Oh boy, I'm so looking forward to the end of this age, aren't you? Yeah. 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 In chapter 17 and verse 26, let's begin there. Jesus said, and as it was in the days of Noah, 
so will it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the days that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Hosea declares that they have sown to the wind, and therefore you will reap the whirlwind. The whirlwind is the wind of God's judgment. It's a hurricane. It's a tornado of God's judgment that's coming upon the earth, just as it did the first time there in Noah's day. It is going to happen again. The judgment is inevitable, isn't it? But it is escapable in Jesus Christ alone, right? The judgment is escapable. Right? But here Jesus says to us, clearly, his church, he said, now, the, the latter days or the end of the age, the end of time will be as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot. And we've talked about this before at length. We went into Romans chapter 1, where in verse 24, God indicates when he begins to give over a society or a nation or a people, he gave them over to a sexual revolution. Remember, we looked at that in verse 24. And then in verse 26, he said, now the next step in that digression, in that downward spiral would be he would give them over to a homosexual revolution, homosexual revolution, verse 26 of chapter 1. And then in chapter 28, finally, he gave them over to a insane mind where they can't, they no longer have the capacity or the mental capability to think straight as in the days of Noah. And days of Noah were characterized, if you read Dr. Henry Morris's book on the Genesis record, uh, you'd find out the days of Noah were characterized by militant homosexuality, in-your-face homosexuality, violence, wickedness, and violent activity, just anger and violence and malice everywhere. The, the crime in our cities today, it's unbelievable, isn't it? The lawlessness and the lack of law enforcement. There's crime reporting, but it doesn't seem to many crime prevention any longer, does there? The murder rate is up everywhere. Militant, homosexual activity, violence, crime. And then an obsession in, in, in Lot's day and in Noah's day, unfortunately, what happens when a people digress and they rebel against God and they go into sexual perversion, they go into such anger and such jealousy and, and such violence, they, they play right into the hand of the devil and then they begin to seek out and worship the devil. In Noah's day, there was an obsession with the occult, a very unhealthy obsession with the occult. Would you say that characterizes the society in which we live today? You know, I, I've shared this with you before, but let me share it again. Before 1960, 1960 began a sexual revolution in our country. And shortly after that, the 80s began the homosexual revolution. And now we have the reprobate mind of most who lead us now. We don't have any leaders, do we? They all seem to be so insane. Hmm? But before, prior to 1960, you would be hard-pressed to find any serious work or any volume of work on, with regard to the occult. It was an avoided subject. Nobody wanted to know anything about Satan or Satanism or how to receive the power of the devil. But since then, you go to any university in the country and you'll see major sections within the library devoted to the occult, to witchcraft, to Wiccan. Unbelievable, isn't it? As in the days of Noah, so Jesus said. Likewise, verse 28, and so it was in the days of Lot, verse 29, but on the day that the fire and he destroyed them all, even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, with the... Revelation is, revelation singular, it's not revelations plural. What the revelation is, if you were to describe that in one sentence, what would you tell me? That's it. Yes, John. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's the revealing of God and coming in all of his glory and all of his power. Remember when Jesus predicted to the other disciples with regard to the apostle John, what is it to you if this man should remain until I come? That he would see the second coming of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And surely John did see it in the revelation, didn't he? When he was on the Isle of Patmos in that divine solitary confinement, right? He had the revelation of God greater than any man had ever received before, the unveiling of the coming of Jesus Christ. 
to be revealed. Now, there are some signs that we look for that indicate we're in that time. There is a major sign that has been fulfilled in our time that previous to 1940, 1930, uh, most theologians had no belief that Israel would become a nation among the nations once again, that it was gone, destroyed, removed from the earth forever. That's not so, is it? Look at Luke 21. Turn there. Luke 21. Again, Jesus is speaking. Uh, uh, Luke 21 as a parallel to Matthew 13 and, uh, excuse me, to Matthew 24 and Mark 14. These are apocalyptic chapters speaking of the second coming of Christ. And so in with that regard, in chapter 21 and verse 24, he said uh, that many will fall by the edge of the sword, led away captive in Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be trampled, trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So God is indicating that the Gentiles will control Jerusalem and control the land of Israel. Israel until the very end when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled when the last Gentile believer comes to faith and the church is raptured then God will be pouring out a spirit upon the nation of Israel we'll talk a lot more about that in weeks coming but what I want to look at right now is this parable with regard to the fig tree in verse 29. Now you know that when you use the principle of hermeneutics and you're studying the scriptures, when anything is mentioned, first mentioned in the Old Testament in a figurative sense, not a literal meaning of the word, but a figurative meaning of the word of the object, it's going to maintain that figurative meaning throughout the scriptures, right? And so when we speak of the fig tree, the first time it's mentioned, what is it referring to in the Old Testament? Israel, the nation of Israel. And throughout all of the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, when God is speaking of the fig tree in a figurative sense, he always is speaking of the nation of Israel. Make no mistake about that. Prior to this, Matthew records for us that Jesus was going into Jerusalem once again, and he was going to have a, another conflict with the religious leaders of the day. But before he went in, there was a fig tree there, and he saw the fig tree, and it was bearing forth leaves, but it was fruitless, representative of the fact that the nation of Israel, although very religious, were bearing no fruit whatsoever for God. We have a very religious society here, don't we? But how much true fruit is there being born for God? Hmm. How many people truly do live surrendered to his will? Somebody asked me the question while I was away who I thought the true church was. I said, well, the only answer I can give you is that I know that 2% of the church shares their faith. 2%. That's not very good, is it? Why? Because Jesus gave us a command. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and what? Make disciples. Don't gossip. Share your testimony. Right? <laughs> go, go share your testimony. Make disciples. But only 2% of the church shares their faith. Isn't that unbelievable? That 2% also does what? Tithes. Tithes. So I, I would say from my uh, deduction is that probably 2% is a healthy number. You consider that 2% of those who profess to be believers are believers, right? And that's what I'm saying here tonight. But nonetheless... Jesus is speaking, and he's talking about the parallel of the fig tree, and that the, originally he went into Jerusalem, he saw the fig tree, it had leaves upon it, but there was no fruit, fruitless, as much of the professing church is today, fruitless for God. They, their lips draw nigh unto me, but your hearts and your lives, far from me. As I preached my friend's son's uh, funeral this weekend, I made emphasis of the fact that Jesus said, that those who live and believe in me will have eternal life. What's the first prerequisite? Living in Christ. And what does it mean to live in Christ? To truly be genuinely a Christian. And that everyone in your life would have no doubt that that's true of you. Right? Because you're living in Christ. Those who live and believe in me have eternal life. Because the devil believes, doesn't he? He's not saved. So a lot of people have head knowledge or information about Jesus, but that hasn't entered into their heart and changed their life the way it should. 
So Jesus goes into Jerusalem. There's the fig tree representing Israel, bearing leaves but no fruit, the religiosity of it all. It's a facade, you see. And what did he do? He cursed the fig tree, withered and died. The next day it tells us that the disciples went by that same tree and it was dead all the way down to its root system. You know, if you're walking through the woods, you ever see one of those trees that are so dead you could kick it over with your foot? Well, that's how this tree would the very next day. But then Jesus gives this very parable so his disciples would understand he hasn't forsaken Israel. God forbid. No, if God doesn't keep his promises as unilateral promises to Israel, there's no reason for you and I to think he's going to keep the promises he made to the church. But he will. And here he prophesies and promises the rebirth of the nation. Look, chapter 17, 21, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 29 Chapter 21 of Luke's Gospel, verse 29, and he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all of the trees. When they are already budding, you see and you know for yourselves that summer is near. So you likewise, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Hallelujah. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Yeah. What does it gain a man if he should inherit the wealth of the world and lose his soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? What Jesus is indicating there, you see, a value of an object is based upon the owner of the, the object, right? He determines its value. And God is saying that one solitary soul is worth more to him than the accumulated wealth of the world. Why don't we see people that way? Lord, help us. Give us a renewed understanding of how we're to see one another. Well, he's indicating here that the generation of people that sees Israel, the leaves, the life, come back into the fig tree and fruit, that generation will see the end of the age. They won't escape this world without seeing his coming, the revealing of Jesus Christ. And, and we know that has taken place. It's happened, hasn't it? Now, again, theologians prior to 1930, 1940, uh, had thought it was preposterous for you to believe that Israel was going to become a nation among the nations once again. Dead, gone, judged. Why? Because they were the Christ killers. The anti-Semitism that existed. But there were a handful that believed in God's promise to Israel. And then it was realized, it was fulfilled 1940, May 14th, 1940. Israel becomes a nation among the nations once again. And then the ancient language of Israel, the Hebraic language, is resurrected. This is a miracle. Nothing like this had ever happened before. It'll never happen again. But it's, that is the number one sign for the church, for you and I, for the body, that we are in the end of the age. The generation that sees this will see the end of the age. Now, I, I believe the clock started kicking, not in 1948, but when? 1967. 1967 is when Israel had occupied and captured the Temple Mount and all of the land mass, the land area, that it had when Jesus made this prophecy, this parable of the leave of the fig tree. And so 1967, and we can estimate what a biblical generation is, approximately 50-plus years. So we're very, very, very close, aren't we? And then there is a multitude of other signs, which I'm not going to go into tonight, or I, would, I don't have time. But my, many of you are students of Bible prophecy. And there is a multitude of signs that are taking place right now, just the technological signs, the things that God said would be done during the time period of the latter days or the end of the age weren't possible until our day. The... the mode of communication where the whole world could see the same event at the same time in real time that had never existed before the weapons of mass destruction where we have the capability to destroy the planet we can we can render planet earth completely sterile you understand that we have that kind of destructive capability today it'll be a sterile cylinder out there in the universe not a germ not a bacteria alive Never before have we had that destructive capability. And Jesus said, unless those days be shortened, no 
flesh, no life, literally in the Greek text, no life would be left on the planet unless Jesus intervened at the precise moment that he does. And we talked about that before. You know the reason for that. But what the Bible predicts is that there's going to be a growing anti-Semitism to where the whole world will look the other way when Israel is attacked. Unnecessarily, when they are plundered, pillaged, brutalized, murdered, just the same way Russia is doing to Ukraine, there's going to be an invasion of Israel. But they won't succeed. Let's take a look at what the Bible has to say in Ezekiel chapter 36. Go there. Now, in Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 8, what would you, how would you sum up that portion of the chapter, if you've read it before or studied it before? What would you say that God is indicating there? That's right. It's a restoration of the land of Israel. Okay? What God is promising to the Jewish people, that he is going to restore the land. He restores the land for a restored people. And then he brings the people back into the land. He's going to restore them both physically and spiritually to the land. This is what he's saying here, beginning in verse 8. But you, O mountains of Israel, uh, good evening. We're in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 8. You can come forward. You, you can hear a little better. Yeah, Adele wants you to sit with her. <laughs> It's always better late than not at all. <laughs> right? Yeah. Chapter 36 of Ezekiel is where we are. We're talking about God's restoration of the land of Israel. He's going to restore the people back to the restored land, and he's going to restore them spiritually back to himself, and then Satan will try to do his dirty. Hmm? But here we are in verse 8 of chapter 36. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed I am with you, and I will turn you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all of the house of Israel, all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited, and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times and do better for you at your do better for you than at your beginning then you shall know that I am the Lord aren't we glad it gets much much better at the end than at the beginning well that's what he's saying here to Israel further on in the chapter look at verse 22 talking about the physical and spiritual restoration of the people Chapter 36, verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. Who would, who would serve God if God didn't enable, enable them? Who would even turn to God if God didn't give them the capacity, right? We know and recognize that it's God's gift of grace, grace gift of faith that he gives us to believe in Jesus in the first place. We're not willing, nor do we have the ability, right? No desire, no ability to come to him unless he gives it. And this is what he's saying here. And why does he do it? For his glory. Yeah. Does anybody know the five solas of the Reformation? Sola fide. But what's the first one? Sola scriptore, the scriptures alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola fide, faith alone. In sola Christos, Christ alone. To sola gloria, to the glory of God alone, right? So recognizing those five solas of the Reformation, you're recognizing God did it all. He did it all for Israel. Not for your sake, Israel, for my great namesake. And he's done it all for the church. All we offer him is our rebellion and our sinfulness, right? And in exchange, he gives us his beauty and the beauty of submission and obedience. Hmm? Yes, therefore say to the whole house of Israel, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went, and I will sanctify my great name, which you have profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all of the countries, and bring you into the, your own land. When did that ever happen before? 
It never did. He, he came back from Babylon, from the Babylonian captivity, one nation. But now he's talking about the regathering of the people of Israel back into the land. And then when he restores them physically to the land that he has restored, he's going to restore them spiritually unto himself for the glory of his name. It's amazing. I've been saved for 42 years. And even, even now, I go back home and my family's still just in awe. It, I don't know how bad they thought I was, you know. <laughs> but it's to the glory of God, isn't it? Yeah. And so that's what we're showing him. We're, we're, we're declaring the offshine, the glory of God in our salvation, our sanctification, in our Christ-like living. Because they know who we were formerly. Oh, but some, uh, so were some of you, right? And the scriptures tell us. Yeah. A fornicator, a thief, a blasphemous man. And so Israel... And the restoration of Israel is to the glory of God because only God couldn't do what's going to be done in Israel. Wouldn't we, oh, wouldn't we wish, pray, beg that he would do it to the United States? I, I don't know that he will, but I'm praying for I just don't know that he will. Before this restoration of the nation, fellas, as we were studying Jeremiah, you remember God was judging Jeremiah for their idolatry. They were profaning the name of the Lord and, and, and before all of the heathens. And God tells Jeremiah three times, no less than three times, what did he tell him? Do not pray for these people. Wow. And I shared with the fellows then, I said, I, I wonder if God's saying the same thing about the United States. We're so far gone. But we are to pray. Pray always. Hmm? Yes, verse 24, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all of the countries and bring you into your own land, and then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. That baptismal that only comes from the Holy Spirit, right? You did the water baptism on Saturday. Congratulations, Nick. Hmm? But water baptism is simply symbolic of that spiritual baptism that takes place, that cleansing of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's talking about here. That's what's going to happen to the people of Israel. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to keep my judgments and to do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I shall give to your fathers. You shall be my people. I will be your God. Wow. Wow. So there was a national rejection of the Messiah by the people of Israel, and there was a rejection by God of the people of Israel. But it wasn't to be in total, was it? It wasn't to be permanent. It was temporary. And God is prophesying here that he's going to restore the people back to the land. He's done that, hasn't he? Jews have come from all over the world to make Aliyah back into Israel, right? Now, now, all of Israel is not spiritually where they need to be. And they won't be there until when? The rapture of the church. The church is raptured, and then God is gonna, God's going to fulfill exactly what he prophesied here in Ezekiel, prophesied in Joel, prophesied in Zechariah, that he's going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon the Jewish people, a spirit of supplication and grace, and they will look upon him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn. So there'll be a spiritual awakening. You know, you know, for our unsaved family and friends, we need to pray that God would allow them to experience that born-again experience. Remember on Resurrection Sunday, I preached that every, every believer experiences how many resurrections? How many resurrections? Two. How many? Two. Okay, good. Two. The first one is what we would call the born-again experience, where your, your spirit is resurrected, made alive, and realizes who God really is. He is your creator, your father. Well, we'll talk more about the fatherhood of God Sunday. Yeah. But then the second resurrection that every believer will experience will be the resurrection of the body. Hallelujah. Hmm? And so that's what he's really referring to here, that there's going to become a spiritual resurrection of the nation. It hasn't happened yet. The, resur the restoration of the land, that's occurred, hasn't it? They took the desert, and the desert has become an oasis. 
the engineering agricultural efforts of the Jews have made them the largest exporter of fruits in the world into, to Europe, and their second largest exporter of tulips, flowers, flora. They ship tulips to Holland. <laughs> How many of you have been to Israel and seen some of the gardens? And Yeah, it's just fascinating. I, I remember going to Israel and going through a banana uh, plantation where they were showing how they, they grow bananas. And they grow bananas in a bag. Anybody ever see that? And then so uh, a few years later, I was down in Guatemala, in Zacapa, Guatemala, uh, where actually Puerto Barrios, where Chico Lopez was born. We were visiting Chico's family, and there's a big banana plantation. Do you know Chico had never wore a pair of shoes until he came to the United States? He was a young man, never, had a, never owned a pair of shoes. His fascinating story. If you ever get a chance, you should talk to him about his journey in life. Fascinating. Oh, by the way, he's the one doing all the stonework for us. Isn't it looking beautiful? Yeah. David's design, his hard work, and David did the signing for it, didn't he? Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful to have such creative people, you know? But nonetheless, as I was going through the banana plantations in Guatemala, I said to the guy who was leading us on the tour, I said, this is exactly what they do in Israel. He said, of course it is. They showed us how to do this. <laughs> There's a very, very close working relationship between Guatemala and the state of Israel. Do you know why? Some of you know why. Yes. Guatemala cast the deciding vote, the deciding vote in 1948 for Israel to become a nation among the nations once again. And there's a very strong relationship between Guatemala and Israel. Israel has, has built the road all the way from Guatemala City to the coast to Puerto Barrios, right? The Israel engineers are over there, the agricultural engineers, civil engineers. I mean, they do everything they can to help Guatemala. And oh, by the way, Unlike every other Central and South American country, which is predominantly in religion, Catholic. Catholic, my people would say, my Italian friends, family, Catholic, Catholic. Unlike every other Central and South American country that is predominantly Catholic, Guatemala is evangelical. I will bless those that, yeah, it's true, it's all true, you know. But nonetheless, so now we, chapter 37 is actually the vision of all of that taking place, the, the vision of the restoration of the people to the land, the Valley of Dry Bones. You've read that before, right? So we don't need to go through that. But I would like to say that on February the 3rd, on 2010, what happened? Stereo, stereo over here. <laughs> Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu announced to the world at Auschwitz on February 3rd, 2010, that Ezekiel 37 has been fulfilled in our day. Isn't that fascinating that he would say that? That the Valley of Dry Bones, the vision that Ezekiel had seen, that God had given him, that the people would come back and rise up out of the land has actually occurred. Do you think he read 38 and 39? You betcha he did. Now, there, there's reason to believe that Benjamin Netanyahu is a Messianic Jew, that he believes in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. If he would announce that publicly, what would happen? His political career is over. Right. Yeah, his political career would be over. But, but there's reason to believe, there's many indicators that indicate that Netanyahu does embrace Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So he indicated back in 2010 that Ezekiel 37 has been fulfilled. Ezekiel 30 and 39, I believe, are right around the corner. And that's what we're looking at tonight. The next two prophetic events to occur, the Gog Magog invasion of Israel or the rapture of the church, we do not have the ability to determine which is which, which will come first. Now, I'm prepared to see the Gog Magog invasion of Israel. And... and It'll be shortly after that. How about <clears throat> Psalm 86? Psalm 86 has been fulfilled where the nations surrounding Israel have come after her. Yeah. And Isaiah 17 is yet to be fulfilled. What was that? The complete and total destruction of Damascus. 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 Now, <clears throat> let, me, let me, don't get ahead of me. <laughs> but I'm going there. <laughs> Chapter 38. Let's look there for a minute. In chap chapter, interestingly, in chapter 37, just uh, put your eyes upon verse 22 for a minute. 
I will make them one nation in the land and the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all, and they shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. When did Israel become two kingdoms? After the death of King Solomon. Solomon. You had, you had Saul, David, Solomon. After the death of Solomon, it, it, it divided king. You had the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And then you had Syria carry away the northern kingdom of Syria, 722 B.C., 721. 721 B.C., they carried away the northern kingdom of Israel. 586 B.C., the Babylonians carried away the southern kingdom of Judah, never to be a nation again. But after, after the captivity and making their way back into Israel, they were one nation now. And who was the king after that? Who was the king after the Babylonian captivity? Who was the king of Israel? Jesus. Jesus. There, there was no king. There was no Jewish king in Israel again. And so that's what they're referring to here, is that no longer will there be two nations, there will be one nation, they will have one king. And who's going to be their king? Jesus. Jesus, of course, yeah. Now, now look at 38. We've got a little bit of time left. Now the word of the Lord came to me, came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, set your face again. We're in chapter 38 of Ezekiel, verse 1, okay? Chapter 38. My wife says, I, I speak too fast, and I never give you the reference, and so I don't want to lose you, okay? Where are we? 38, verse 1, okay. How's that, dear? Yes, I love you too. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog in the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So the, he's against this leader of these, this, these, this nation in which are these city-states, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all of your army, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed the great company with bucklers, with shields, all of them handling swords. So the first one about the principal player within this conflict with Israel or the attempted destruction of Israel will be Magog and the leader will be Gog. Next to him will be Persia, verse 5. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, with, with them all of them with shield and helmet. Now who's Persia? Iran. Iran. 1935, Persia was changed, its name was changed to Iran. If you go to Iran today, the Iranians will say, we are Persians, they're Persians. Persia is Iran, second principal player. And, and remember, always it's mentioned in order by prominence, okay, or importance. Ethiopia, what's Ethiopia? Kush, Kush, Ethiopia, Kush. Ethiopia's Ethiopia. You ever been to Ethiopia? Ethiopia would be a number one tourist destination if it wasn't a third world country, I've been there. I spent several weeks in Ethiopia touring the country. It is absolutely, when you get outside the city of Addis Ababa, it is gorgeous. Unbelievably breathtaking. Hmm? But that's what he's referring to here as Ethiopia. And Libya, put in the King James Version, are with them, all of them, with shield and helmet. Gomer, Gomer is East Germany or the East, Eastern um, communist former nation, states, and all of its troops, the house of Togarma. Who's Togarma? Turkey. Turkey. Turkey from the far north and all of its troops. Many people are with them. Prepare yourselves. Be ready. You and all of your companies that are gathered about you and be a guard for them. This word guard is to be a leader and a provider for them. Now, Magog, Magog happens to be the leader and the provider of this confederation of nations that are coming against Israel. Who is Magog? How do you know that? The Russians, the Magagites, if you trace anthropology, you trace this people group. The Magagites are the ancient Scythians. The ancient Scythians are the present day Russians, Ruskies, right? So he's talking about Russians, and it's from the far north. If you had a world map, if we had a world map here tonight, and I put my finger on Jerusalem, and I just went to the extreme north to the next largest city, as far north as you could go, what is it? Moscow, Moscow. And these nation states that he's talking about that are mentioned there, uh, Rosh, uh, 
Rosh Meshach and Tubal, they're former nations within Magog, which are present-day Russian states, different names. Isn't that interesting? Now, here's what I want to point out. How many years ago was this given, this prophecy? A long time ago. Almost, almost 3,000 years ago. And in 3,000 years of world history, of human history, never, ever, ever before has Russia, Iran, and Turkey formed any kind of a confederation, whether it's an economic pact or a military pact or whatever it may be. Never, ever before. Until when? I've got a little clip I want to show you. Are we ready for that, Darren? This is fascinating. Now, listen, I said the major, one of the major signs that we're in the last days is what? The rebirth of the nation Israel, right? Now, the next major sign is what you're going to see on this little clip. We're just going to show a few minutes of it because I want, you to, I want to point out the evidence for exactly what Ezekiel saw. of the matter. <laughs> now, most recently, Russia has made it very clear to Israel, what? Stop those attacks on the Iranian proxies that are there in Syria. The Obama administration abandoned the Middle East. They abandoned Israel, really. And when the American or United States influence and footprint was taken out of the Middle East, you know, nature doesn't like a vacuum, does it? Who fulfilled that vacuum? Russia. Russia has built a tremendous number of military bases in the Middle East, and particularly in Syria, right, with the cooperation of Iran and the Syrian government. And Russia has dom is dominating now that portion of the world. Now, now we do know that Ezekiel, or excuse me, that Isaiah 17, the complete and total destruction of Damascus, will take place. And it'll be Israel that does it. And I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't happen sometime very, very soon. But we see this confederation taking place right now. Isn't that amazing? Something that was prophesied by a desert prophet 20, over 2,500 years ago. Only one explanation for that, isn't it? Must be the Lord, right? God's wisdom. Okay, look at the text now. Let's... 
So it says this confederation is coming together. The, the leader of the group will be Russia. Russia will be the protector and the provider of their weapon tree. It says, verse 7, prepare yourself, be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, this, you will be visited. In the latter years, what does that mean? Latter years, end of time. End of time, the end of the age. In the latter years, you will come back into the land, those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people upon the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and are now all of them dwell safely. Who's he referring to there? Israel. The Jews, Israel. Israel was, was gathered together from all the nations of the world, came, in, came back into Israel. Palestine was desolate. Anytime Palestine, and particularly Jerusalem, has been an inhabited city, a governmental uh, has been established. It's always been the government of Israel, ever since David took over Jerusalem from the Jebusites. It was the Jebusite stronghold. No people group, no nation, no group of people have ever occupied and controlled Jerusalem other than the Jews since that time. But for the longest period of time, it was just desert. It was desolate, just as it's being prophesied here. But they came back into the land and are dwelling safely. That word doesn't mean that they're so much dwelling in security, but they're dwelling in confidence. Israel has tremendous confidence in their military capability, in their defensive capabilities, don't they? Yeah. <sighs> The Iran nuclear deal? What's happening with that? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Iran's walked away. There's no, there's no incentive now be because China and Russia are helping Iran extensively. And so now they're going to go ahead and fulfill their desires for a nuclear weapon. What's Israel going to do about that? They're going to have to make a preemptive strike. You know, when? I, I don't know. I'm just, but I'm, I'm telling you what's, what's the obvious, okay? You know. Verse 9, you shall ascend coming like a storm covering the land like a cloud, you and all of the troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, verse 10, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you shall make an evil plan. You shall say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder, to make booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. What is it that they desire? What are they after? Yes. Oil and gas, the mineral reserves in the, in the Dead Sea. There's tremendous natural resources now that Israel has discovered. Not only, you know, Israel had developed their economy. And they got one of the, probably the strongest economy in the world, strongest currency in the world as well, uh, based upon not natural resources to begin with. What was it based upon? The strength of their economy. No, it wasn't, it wasn't even agriculture. Technology. Technology. The brains, the wisdom, the cell phone you carry. All of the major technologies, all the medical advances that have been made. Most every one of those, have, we have some Israeli scientist, technician to thank for that development. Every single discipline, every single field of study, I don't care what it is, every single study in the arts, music, etc. There's a significant Jewish personality or many Jewish personalities that have made major contributions. Every area of science, every discipline, literature, the arts. Isn't that true? And yet they're half of 1% of the population of the world. Half of 1%. But as I told you before, 30% of what? Nobel Prize winners. Why? The brains. And now, now, not only have they, have they developed their economy to be so strong, now God has shown them these natural resources that were right there. One of the, the uh, petro engineers who was seeking to find and discover oil and gas in Israel used the Bible and what was prophesied of the sons of Jacob by Jacob before he died. And they discovered oil in those very territories where God said that you would dip your toe in oil. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and now Israel has more oil and gas reserves than Saudi Arabia. 
Now, we, we know that Israel is construct, constructing a gas pipeline. Even though we can't produce any gas pipelines here. And, and, and what did John Kerry say yesterday? There'll be no more drilling for oil in the United States? Reprobate mines? Can't think straight? Unbelievable. But anyway, nonetheless, Israel is developing a pipeline from where to where? From the Mediterranean coast, right off of Israel, their, their waters, to Cyprus, to Greece, to Europe. And who do they become a direct competitor with? Russia. Russia. Wow, isn't that amazing? And who does the UN, uh, the uh, European Union, I mean, and Germany in particular, want to try to break their dependence on? Russia. Russia and Russia gas and oil. Isn't that fascinating? So the hook in the jaw that's going to bring Magog down into this battle is that very fact that they will not allow them to be a competitor because Russia's main source of income is their gas and oil exports. Back to the text. Verse 13, it tells us that some nations will protest this attempted invasion and takeover of Israel. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and their young lions will say, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to take away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take away great plunder? So who's complaining? Who's protesting? Saudi Arabia, the Abraham Accord. Saudi Arabia, Sheba and Dedan. And uh, Tarshish? Great Britain and the Young Lions? Canada, Australia, and the United States. Colonies of Great Britain. Isn't that interesting? And we, we would. We would be protesting. Now, we're not going to do anything, but we're going to protest. How much have we really done to help Ukraine? Really? And let me, let me make it very clear. There are no good guys. Zelensky's not a good guy. And Putin is a very bad guy. Okay? But there are no good guys in this situation. And now, the United States and Europe has made the decision to let... Putin have his way with eastern Ukraine, the Donbass area. You understand what's going on there? OK. And what, what, what are the ramifications of all of this? I'm sorry? Oh, oh OK, OK. But, but Ukraine, Ukraine, before this invasion, what was Ukraine known for? Uh -huh. Fertilizer, what else? We, it, listen, it was the breadbasket of Europe. Did you know that? Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. There's going to be food shortages all over Europe now. It's causing tremendous pain and suffering, you know, for the free world. Amazing. The idiocy that is taking place in the leaders of our government. If we only had orange men back, huh? That's what they call them. Fourteen. Fourteen. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will I not know it? Of course, because you put them there. You prophesied it. Then you will come from your place out of the far north, Russia, Moscow. You and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company, a mighty army. You will come against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days, at the end of time, the end of the age, that I will bring you against my people so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Yeah. I think uh, Anthony Delgado, he spoke to you on a Wednesday night, talked about Gideon. And the forces of Gideon. And the forces of Gideon were how many when they finally went into the battle? And against how many? No, against how many? Against 135,000. 300 against 135,000. What kind of odds are those? That's like little David going against a Goliath, right? Same, 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 okay? And so this is going to be the scenario relived all over again. What that was in type, this is in reality that when all of this power and might comes against the nation of Israel, no one is going to think that they can possibly survive, just as right after they became a nation in 1948 and all of the Arab states attacked Israel, everybody thought it's over. They'll be a nation for a week. 
and look what happened miraculously. The 1967 war, I don't know if you remember, some of you were here, but we did a series on several Sunday nights of showing videos and, and, and documentaries of how miraculously it was by the hand of God that preserved Israel to become a nation. That they, they were constantly teetering on the edge of destruction. 1976 war, the 1973 war, the Yom Kippur war, unbelievable what had taken place, the hand of God. And so that's exactly and precisely what's going to take place here. As these nations come against the nation of Israel, it's going to look like they have no hope. Why? Because, listen to me, because they won't have a friend in the world. The church is gone. Who's going to support Israel? You know, even Benjamin Netanyahu, who made the statement that the best friend that Israel ever had is the Zionist Christians. Zionist Christians. What's a Zionist Christian? <laughs> I'm sorry? A Christian who believes that, that Israel has a right to that land God-given. God deeded the land to Israel. Hmm? Yeah. And when the church is gone, all the nations of the world will be against Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? All the nations of the world making war against the city of peace. <laughs> A reprobate mind for sure. Thus says the Lord God, he, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? He's speaking about uh, prophecies within Joel. Joel was written in 835 B.C. Ezekiel was written in 590, 570 B.C. In, Ze in Zephaniah, Zephaniah prophesied. It. Zephaniah was written at uh, 363 B.C. So, so Zephaniah and Joel were written prior to Ezekiel. God is referring to those prophecies that were written, that God had shared. God has revealed everything we need to know, hasn't he? You know, it's just so simple. My wife and I were talking about Father's Day coming up and... <sighs> And just how sad it is, a number of children that have not been fathered. Even fathers who are biologically there, but not, not, not present, not fathering their children. And then the problems within families today and marriages. And, and, and yet, but we've had this guidebook for centuries to how to be loving fathers and husbands, how to be loving brothers and sisters how we should conduct ourselves one with another. And, and it would bring such order and such peace and such beauty. What were you saying on Sunday, some of the bigger problems in the schools when you were growing up? Talking, Talking chewing gum, you know? In my, in my day was horseshoe taps. You know, we wore these big, we wore these cordovan. Anybody remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You slick your hair back with axle grease, you know? And have a big do in the front. And you wear these big cordons, these horseshoe taps, ka ching, ka ching, ka ching. That's why they call them that, you know. The greasers, you know. Take your cigarettes, roll them up in your t shirt, you know. <laughs> but the biggest problems we had were maybe smoking behind the school, you know. Today, unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Why? What's the result? We're not following the guidebook. We've had it for centuries now. And we choose not to follow it. You know, you're in the car business, aren't you? Hmm? And when you're going to look at a car and the service you have to do and how to maintain your car, you go to what? The owner's what? The owner's manual. Uh -huh. Isn't that what this is? Owner's manual? How do we maintain these relationships? How do I maintain my own life? How do I maintain integrity and wholeness? Hmm. I think we're going to have to stop at uh, chapter 38. Look at chapter 39 next week, okay? Yes. God had prophesied these things before. Verse 18, And it shall come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in my fire and my wrath I have spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the sea, all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all of the men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against God throughout all of my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring 
bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down upon him and upon his troops and upon many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, brimstone. Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Wow, there's, there's such a disregard for God today. No, we don't want to see that. No, 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 no. No, when he, in verse 19, when he says, uh, surely in that day there should be a great earthquake. And then he talks about this cataclysmic upheaval that takes place on the face of the earth. Isaiah describes this. You know what he describes? Well, go to Isaiah 24 for a minute. And we'll end here. Let, let's see. I'm, I'm free to keep you till 8.30 on Wednesdays now, right? Is that right? <laughs> 9 o'clock? Is that what you said? <laughs> Chapter 24 of Isaiah is called Isaiah's Apocalypse. Isaiah is describing the total destruction of the earth. He's, he's, he's describing what is a polar axis shift. The earth is going to shift on its axis. And when it does, you know, uh, the earth is just a top spinning, right? And you got all that molten uh, material underneath in the center of the earth. Boy, did you see the latest discoveries and calculations they made about the amount of melted rock that's beneath Yellowstone? It's absolutely staggering. They, they thought there was a certain amount at one time, and now through a lot of technological advances, they're shocked. It's the largest supervolcano in the world, and it contains the largest amount of, of boiling molten rock. And if that blows, forget it. A third of the United States is gone. A third of the country, gone. Amazing. Now, when, when this polar axis shift takes place, and you don't want to be here. Oh, that. Well, we might see a little bit of that. I think we're already seeing... I want to see God's hand stretch out well, these people. <laughs> no, I won't be here for that. I don't want to be here for that. I want to be in the Hallelujah Chorus, you know, at the marriage feast of the Lamb, you know? I don't want to be late for supper. You know. But when this polar axis shift takes place, imagine, you know, something is spinning, and it's being perfectly balanced, Okay. And, and inside that liquid that's inside, that's all spinning perfectly balanced. Now, all of a sudden, it gets thrown out of balance. Then every, all these forces are taking place throughout all over this sphere. Now, that's what, that's what Ezekiel, or excuse me, that's what Isaiah is describing in verse 24, chapter 24. Look at chapter 24 of Isaiah. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty, makes it waste, distorts its surface, scatters abroad its inhabitants, and that shall be as with the people, so with the priest, the servant, the master, the maid, the mistress, the buyer, the seller, the lender, the lawyer, the bower. Everybody, everybody in the whole world will be affected by this. No one won't be affected by this when this event occurs. Nobody. You remember the Christmas Day tsunami? How horrific that was? 250,000, yeah, is that right? Yeah, quarter of a million people were killed. 50,000 bodies never even recovered. That is nothing, nothing in comparison to what's going to take place on this day. Every single man, woman, child, beast, bird, and fish of the ocean are going to feel the effect of this situation. It's worldwide, it's global. The land will utterly empty, be emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth language. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few, few men are left, almost no one. Whose fault is this? It's their fault. It says that. They've done this. Listen, God's judgment is the last recourse. He doesn't want to judge. His grace is so absolutely amazing, isn't it? Isn't it? And he only judges when he absolutely has to. And he has to judge just before mankind attempts to completely destroy life on the planet. 
If the Son of Man had not intervened, no flesh would be left. But he's going to judge, and he's going to restore, and then he's going to allow Israel to re-inhabit the earth repopulate. And he's going to allow the church to reign with him as kings and priests unto our God. What a wonderful... You, you, we can't even imagine, can we? You know, I, I like to use the comparison. I, I, I never read, nor have I seen any of his movies. Stephen King? But, but he's demonically influenced. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You know, people who like uh, macabre and horror, uh, they, they, they idolize Stephen King. Stephen King is demonically influenced. But he can let his demonically influenced mind run wild, and he can't scratch the surface on the horror of hell or when God judges. Can't scratch the surface. I grew up when, when Disney was wonderful. I grew up every Sunday night watching the wonderful world of Disney, you know. And it was wonderful, and the colors, and it just, I mean, just the imagination, you know. It just, you, you wanted to live in that world, didn't you? Now, you let Walt Disney let his wonderful imagination run wild. He can't scratch the surface on what? On how wonderful heaven is going to be. We can't. We can't. Eye has not seen, ears not heard, the heart that I can't even imagine or conceive the things I have prepared for thee. Isn't that wonderful? All we have to do is follow the manufacturing manual, and it will be well with us and with those that we love. So next week, we'll continue looking at this prophecy concerning the destruction of Gog and Magog and those with him. And it's going to be quite fascinating. Read ahead and come with your questions. We'll pursue it together. Amen?